All right, guys, this video is all about predator dubbing loops. Now, I use the word predator for a reason. We're not using, you know, rabbit fur and some SLS dubbing and a little bit of ice fiber or something like that. I'm talking bucktail, coarse, long synthetics like strung fuzzy fiber, SF blend. I'm talking about flashy, but we're talking about big game, big hard coarse materials that are technical to work with and i want to go over the technique basis and fundamentals for working with those materials in a dubbing loop and at the same time we'll go over dubbing loop tool design i'm gonna bramer with bramer's custom flies so i'm going to do a dubbing loop demonstration without any materials i don't want the materials to be a distraction in any way shape or form i'll then break it down to different material categories bucktail flashaboo strong fuzzy fiber to be kind of like the main three that i use uh, that way you can see how the materials are handled, how they're prepped, the proportions of the loop, the relative density that I use, right? Because those are all important factors. But loop basics. First off, it's going to be thread choice. I'm either going to use a GSP, usually 150 or 200 strand GSP, or I'm going to use 210 Flymaster Plus. I'm going to demonstrate this near the head of the fly because that's typically where loops are done to finish predator flies. And I'm also going to do it on a lighter wire hook so that you can see the hook deform and flex in the vise so you understand how hard I am pulling and when I am pulling that hard. Now, if you've never done a dubbing loop before, what you're going to do is you're going to draw out material, catch it in your finger, return your thread back to the hook. Now, when you do this, there's going to be a little gap down here that is going to be the width of the diameter of the hook. You need to close that gap or else the materials won't get pinched by the thread. So you take your bobbin, you go around it and that will essentially create a nice little tight V so that all the materials that you put in the loop when it's time to do that will be pinched nice and tight. You then wrap that loop back to the starting point, put a thread base over top of it and make sure you Chinese finger trap it back, forth, back again. That way it can't ever pull out. <clears throat> now you're going to take a tool, you're going to put a dubbing loop tool in the loop. I prefer basically just a straight shepherd's hook. So you can see this tool, it has a double hook in it and it's so that you can put one side of the loop on either side so it's open, but I just think that's silly. So I just use one loop. Then you're gonna come in with some wax. Now the wax isn't to keep the material necessarily uh, in the loop and on the hook and for durability reasons. I do think you get some of those added benefits, but for the most part, and so that when you put it in there, you can kind of manipulate it and the thread has some grip on it and you can change the proportions and slide it up and down and just the thread pressure of the thread being pinched shut is enough to keep everything in there so that you can work with it and get the desired results. Quick side note, I would heavily recommend you invest in a C-clamp. Having a vise that cannot move from my tying table is absolutely critical to being able to do predator dubbing loops and actually pull on the thread and actually make them durable and actually wind it onto the hook with a lot of pressure because half the pressure is in the loop so you twist all these materials and they're kind of stuck in the loop nice and snug the other half of the pressure is when you wind it on and you got to manhandle these things and actually control them and actually wind them on so that the thread has pressure against that hook shank and you make something that's durable and it's going to last countless fish so buy a c clamp buy a 15 pound granite pedestal base, something like that, so that you can perform the technique without dragging your vise around and picking it up and knocking it over, because it will drive you crazy. Now, you would open this loop up, insert your materials, manipulate them into the proportions that you want, typically longer, closest to the hook, shorter moving forward, that way you can build uh, the progression of tips from the shoulder to the tail, much like the bucktail deceiver video. So you're gonna go from long to short, long down here, short up here. I hold my thread, flat. It's completely flat, right? It's parallel to the floor. It's, it's level. So the materials in here, they're not falling into the hook. They're not falling into me. I'm not spinning it down at an angle. So they're all leaning one way or the other. They're nice and flat. The material should be sticking out perpendicular. This is the second most critical thing you're ever going to do. All the materials hanging in between this thread have to be perpendicular to the thread. They have to be. If your materials have uh, if they're trapped over each other and they're kinking one way or the other, when you go to spin this loop up and you put tension on those materials, they're going to take the path of least resistance, which is not getting trapped in your thread. They're going to tilt forward and get spiral wrapped up the thread instead of spinning perpendicularly and creating a nice big bushy collar. With a level thread, perpendicular material, I'm going to pull this. You see that hook? I want you to see the hook deflect. I'm going to pull this 
towards myself as I begin to spin it. This becomes critical in the design of your dubbing loop tool. I can do this with the Stanfo because I can pull on it and I can spin it at the same time. Absolutely critical. My other favorite tool is the Kelly Gallup dubbing loop tool produced by Rising because it has a very small needle that doubles as a bodkin out the back. Now most tools where you grab it to spin, they have some big large diameter, large circumference base. It makes no sense. If you try to spin this tool up here, it goes very slowly. My fingers cannot cover a lot of ground because it has such a large circumference. If you go down to the needle, woo, I can spin the snot out of that really fast, like wicked fast. That's the whole point of having a needle out the back. I can pull this at myself and I can spin that needle and cover a lot of ground very quickly. So those two tools, in my opinion, are the greatest design. Simple shepherd's hook, you don't need anything more. They should be heavy so that when your thread is resting, it collapses it and pinches those materials so that you can manipulate them. And then a needle coming out the back. So you have a very low circumference so that when you twist your fingers, you cover a lot of ground in the rotation or a ball bearing system that you can twist under tension. Now, when you go to wrap this, this is about the only time I kind of use a rotary vise to its fullest potential. And it's so that I can walk it around under tension. I'm always going to walk it around under tension. So basically, what I mean is I'm going to walk it up a quarter turn, bring everything down. Walk it up a quarter turn, bring it all down. So that as I rotate my vise, my hand comes with me. Walk it up a quarter turn, bring it all down. That way I have complete control over the movement, over the tension, over the pressure. I'm not just going to sit here and spin this. I'm not going to use my hand and try to do some hand-to-hand -hand exchange thing. I'm going to use that rotary function and just section it off one step at a time so that I can pull on it as I wrap it so that I have max pressure, max tension, max durability. Now when you're up at the hook eye and you're ready to tie it off, there's just one more trick to this and it's sucking that thread into the hook eye to make sure you have one of the most durable catches you can. So when I bring this up, I'm going to lift up with my tool. I'm going to take my thread over the top twice, pull down with my thread so the two I have leverage over that hook. I'm not just going to pull down and yank on this and let go. I can use the pressure against my thread to pull up on the tool to suck that dubbing loop as tight to that shank as I can. Then I can relax it, put some thread over top, and it's 100% trapped in as durable as possible. The loop's only at about five inches, maybe four or five inches. It's gonna make sure that you have control over the entire process. Make sure the loop is nice and flat, good and level. You manipulate the material and you start to spin that so that the materials aren't falling towards the hook or falling towards the ground. You want them sticking out of the loop completely perpendicular. The next step is making sure they're perpendicular. Sometimes I'll pick them out with a bodkin. Most of the time I will comb them out before I introduce them to the loop. Any material that is kinked off of perpendicular will wrap around the thread instead of spinning in the loop, creating that volume effect that you want. Now don't trust the loop for all of the durability. Yes, check it, make sure the materials don't slip, but as you wind it on, wind it on with a boatload of pressure, only doing quarter turns and section it off with your vise so that you have complete control over the loop the entire time. Then when you finish, pull up with the tool, down with the thread, suck all the slack out so there's no slack, then catch it and tie off. So that's the Predator dubbing loop. I hope that helps you out. Remember the two tools, whether it's the Stanfo or the Gallop from Rising, but you should be able to pull it under tension while spinning it, lowest circumference in the back so that you can get the most turns relative to your finger spin, and just a simple shepherd hook. That's all you need. So thanks for watching. Hope that helps you out, and I'll check you guys out in the future dubbing loop videos. Thanks guys.